we have another episode for you. I'm so excited. Today, I get to introduce you to Jeff Wasserman. He is a commercial photographer based out of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, way up there in the Great White North. He's going to share with us today a little bit about his journey into the food industry, what it's like to shoot on the set of a commercial studio, and what it's like to work for an agency. He's got a lot of really cool information, tips and tricks and all that good stuff to share with us, plus some interesting insight into what life is like these days during the whole COVID-19 lockdown and all that. Anyways, check out his links, check out his Instagram, all that good stuff. Don't forget to subscribe if you will. It would be awesome because I don't want you to miss out on any other really cool interviews I've got coming along. And uh, without further ado, I give you Jeff. So before we get into it, um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and tell us who you are, where you are, what you do, and then we'll dive right in. Okay. My name is Jeff Wasserman. I am a commercial photographer in Toronto, Ontario, and Canada, and I shoot mostly food, drink, and still life, um, although I do photograph people now and then as well. Yeah, I saw that on your website. <laughs> so it's like a little, <laughs> don't forget, yeah. I also do this, but. Uh, yeah, my... I do. it, And I used to do that quite a bit, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm super curious because it's been really interesting to hear everybody's um, journey into food photography, commercial photography, that kind of stuff. And um, I'm dying to know what your journey was, like how you got into photography and then how you wound up in food and beverage. Well, I, basically, I've been a photographer all my adult life, mm -hmm. and I started out years ago, without dating myself too much, as a commercial photographer. And as a matter of fact, I was just rummaging through a box of old photos and found clippings from, I did like an old catalog, I did an old brochure, all shot with five, four by five transparency. Oh, yeah. Uh, back when. And then I moved into photojournalism, where I was a photojournalist with a national newspaper for about eight years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a lot of fun, did a lot of traveling and uh, a lot of varied assignments. Mm -hmm. And then I became the photo editor of another national newspaper, something I did for 13 years. But during that time, it was an inside job, more of a management position. And I missed shooting and I couldn't really be out there uh, as a photojournalist. It was just too time consuming in the office. And I started shooting food photography and got more and more into shooting food photography and started shooting for stock, eventually for Stocksy yeah. in 2014, and then started building some clients. And in 2016, left my position as photo editor of the National Post and have been uh, full-time back in commercial photography since then. Yeah, no kidding. So do you do you think that Stocksy was sort of a stepping stone into food? Yeah, very for me, very much. Me too, which is kind of funny. Like <laughs> ah. I was I was do well, I was doing I was doing a little bit through like Shutterstock, I think it was. And then I got a big commercial client around 2012 who decided to give me a chance, which was just like chance, just luck. And, and I didn't apply to Stocksy as a food photographer, but then I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to try and see if I can kind of, you know, uh, polish this up a little bit more and build my stock portfolio. And like, it's been a huge catalyst for me to just like try things, you know, yeah, and, yeah kind of a safe I, space. And I mean, the great thing about stock is you can experiment. Exactly. It gives you the room to experiment, whereas commercial work, you don't have that, uh, Ability with stock, you can do what you want, figure it out as you go along. Yeah. Uh, and continually improve that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit like paid uh, personal work. It's, it's In a, a way, if yeah. you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. If you're lucky, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, what was it that drew you to food, though? Well, I think I, first off, I always loved to cook and create food. So, that, that was a natural. And I always loved food photography, looking at food photography. Yeah. And I thought, wow, I, I guess I should try doing this. And yeah. at first I was very bad, I have to say, even though I had a background in commercial photography, I, the stuff I did, and it was not for uh, Stocksy, it was for Shutterstock mm -hmm. and the Microstock agencies. Uh, and it was very poor quality work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> both the, the cooking, the styling and lighting, the, all, all parts of it. But I eventually became somewhat better and better and better. And my, Certainly my strength is not uh, 
uh, cooking or styling the food, to be quite honest. Yeah. I, I do much better working with professional stylists. Yeah. Um, huge. It's a, such a huge asset to have somebody else on set to manage like the food and the styling. You can give input, but having somebody who can handle that and then you can, you know, focus on the rest, the lighting and the set and all that good stuff. Yeah, the the um, I mean, to do a commercial job without a food stylist to me is literally impossible. Or even a set stylist, I, I typically yeah. would have a set stylist and a an assistant to them. Likewise, with the last shoot I did just before the shutdown, yeah, like the there were issues because of the we we're edging on the pandemic, but the uh, food stylist is one of the best in the country. Uh, frankly, was so good at what he did that without him, I don't really think we could have done it. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, what do you what do you love most about it? Or is there? I guess like I should ask: Is do you prefer beverage or food, or are they kind of interchangeable? I love it all. I have to be honest. I I still love shooting. Like one of my favorite shoots was it was uh, a launch of a food company. We made salad dressings and marinades and things. And uh, the bulk of the shoot was recipes and settings. But it was actually much like we would do for stock photography. But we had yeah. a big production. There was like 25 people on set, and uh, it was a crew of it was nine of us, and it was producing just pure food recipe work, which was great. But I also love doing uh, beverage and uh, I just finished, uh, it was, I guess you'd call it a food and beverage shoot, but it's for a fast food company. Mm -hmm. And it's much, much more of a technical shoot. Yeah, what makes it technical? This particular client, first off, everything is everything in it is focus stacked. So you're dealing with each element within the shoot being focus stacked, uh, just to start with, because they want everything sharp or the option of having it not sharp as well through. They need every option. Oh, yeah. Background sharp, background not sharp in varying different degrees. Yeah. And it was sort of a fake kitchen set in the background we had to build and uh, you know, bringing that in and out of focus and often having different variations. But in the very end, every component is shot separately and even that in pieces. And at the end of the day, they want a deliverable with every piece with variations on separate layers isolated. So you end up with 25 to 30 layers in the, in the document so that they can move it around for different layouts uh, that they have and decide whether they want this or not. They're very, happen to be very picky. Yeah. Uh, and they can decide whether they want that little thing in there or not. Those sprinkles can come on or off. Uh, a lot of different variations. In the end, it was actually killed. Oh, because, no. Yeah, well, we, part of it might be revived, but because of the pandemic, they decided yeah. not to go ahead with it. Yeah, I, I imagine there's actually probably a lot of projects that either had the brakes put on because the content was no longer appropriate because everything changed so fast or yeah. the brakes were on just because it, you couldn't finish a production properly. The focus stacking, I'm curious to know, like, what do you use to create the, the stacking part of that? Like you're taking each shot individually and then you bring it into a piece of software to do that. Yeah, what I personally do, I, I do it manually. Mm -hmm. And I uh, use Helicon Focus after that before it goes out to the retoucher. Okay. Typ typically, I'll stack them. So, for instance, this one thing shot had three different drinks in it. Yeah. And um, each drink would be shot. I, I would do a stack of the drink without the topping on it, with the topping on it. All the different components would be stacked separately with each drip. It's done separately. But the focus stacking itself, I bring in the Helicon Focus. Mm -hmm which combines them, does a very good job. Yeah, cool. And then those, that is what I would send out to the retoucher. Yeah, so you stack it first, then retouch it, and then the retoucher. Yeah, stack it first, it, and then it goes out for retouching and compositing. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, to be honest, there's no magic. It's just a, a lot of work. Yeah, well, so do you do focus stacking a lot, or is that like yes. a common request? Really, yeah. How often do you think, would you say that, that comes up as a request and like do clients know to ask for that? It's not that the clients will ask for that mm -hmm. in particular, but what they will want is a certain look and they will want that product especially sharp from the bottom of whatever mm -hmm. to the far top corner of it. They want everything to be yeah. sharp. Yeah, and unless it's something that's moving, and even then you'd you'd isolate that part that's moving, 
and yeah. shoot it separately. So yeah, I, I, I shoot, I would say 99% of the time, I focus stack. Yeah. Uh, and it's really the only way achieve, of achieving that uh, look. That, that yeah. really sharp look. And then you also have the option. You can always blur something out more. Yeah. Uh, you can't bring it back in focus. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Recently, or maybe it wasn't that recent, but you, you connected with an agent, like you were saying. Um, we talked about that. When yeah. Did that happen? How long ago was it, that? It, it's uh, the summer will be three years. Oh, wow. Gosh, it feels like it was like just yesterday that we were talking about I know, that. Time goes by pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how has that made a difference for you? Oh, it's a world of difference, frankly. A, they're, they're a very good agent. Like I had talked with another uh, agency before and we just couldn't come to any kind of agreement. Yeah. My agents now are fantastic. They also act as my producers. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah which you'd have to have on set anyway. So they produce the shoot. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the other big thing is they have access to uh, agencies and are able to pitch in places that I couldn't get into. Uh, and they have the connections. And my last, my, my new big client, uh, any of the big clients I've had basically in the last few years have been through them. They have found a client, the client's connected with them. This last one in the agency is actually a worldwide agency, but their photo production is actually based in Florida, in Miami. Yeah. Oddly enough. Yeah. And for me to make that connection, it would be very unlikely. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Well, so uh, speaking of sort of the international aspect of it, but also during this pandemic, do you have any sort of gut sense of like what's going to happen when things start to open back up? Do you feel like you guys are going to be pressured if you're not already open, but we're open? Because, for example, we have restaurants open this week in Florida. Wow. I know it, it's not wise but it's happening <laughs> yeah i mean the, the truth is the virus is here and nothing has changed there's no vaccine but yeah right. i feel i feel matter of fact this client uh, my big client they wanted to shoot in may yeah uh, i had to say we don't think that's possible but we will be shooting in june it looks like yeah um the difference being i'm sure everybody on set will still be masked we will have six foot distancing every area there'll be no overlap in areas for instance the food stylist will be the only ones touching anything in the kitchen mm -hmm. or food on set the set stylist will be the only one touching the props the uh lighting technician will be the only one touching the grip yeah uh, equipment and lighting equipment well, the digitech will just be touching the digital technician station and cabling and all be touching the camera equipment and the client will be one art director on set normally they'd have about 10 wow. uh, people at least on set there'll be one art director on set and everything will be remotely approved and the worst part of that is it slows everything down to a crawl yeah no kidding well and then also though like if you've got um somebody who's who's uh approving remotely have this do you run into that a lot and and probably not it sounds like you usually have a, a whole crew of art directors on set like you said but is the person going to have to be able to come across the border to be on set in june i wonder if that is even going to be doable no i mean actually for the client uh, i'm talking about they actually have an office in toronto oh. as well at the art to work to work yeah they have offices about five locations yeah um so that's that's not an issue it just slows it down because they like to approve every little bit for instance if you put the condensation on you have to then shoot the condensation and wait for an approval on the condensation if you yeah they're they depending on the client they are uh can be very picky so that you're shooting and then they go no the last stage of it we don't like it it's like okay you scrap it and do a complete refresh start yeah. again so it's yeah it makes it slow whereas if they're on set uh, yeah. I always get approval as the job is in progress. Much easier that way, for sure. Yeah, you just can't afford after at the end of the day for them to say oh, they don't like something. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Do you feel like also when they're there on set, they get a better feel for what it takes to make something happen so that they can be a little more maybe aware of the time it might take or that effort or the skill that it takes? Like, does that factor in, do you think, at all? That's a good question. I haven't yeah. really thought about that. Yeah, uh, my my feeling is it really depends if it's somebody experienced. Yeah, 
Um, they know things take a long time and um, they're going to be as demanding as they are, whether they're on set or not. So, but if you have an inexperienced client, I think that could affect it where they don't understand yeah. uh, how. I had, a, had another, it was actually a big account, another fast food one where they had a compliance person on set always who made sure that everything was being done to their specifications and that there was no variance in what we were doing and what was being served in their store. She got frustrated at one point and said, I don't know why you're taking so long to do this. This is so easy. Oh. And so she actually took, took the drink. It was a coffee pour into cream. Yeah. And so she tried it. She took it aside and she started doing it. And after about 20 times of not oh, being geez. able to do it, she said, oh, okay. I guess I didn't understand. <laughs> so if you have somebody like that working <laughs> remotely, it, yeah, it could be very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. I'd be, I'd be curious to know if there's any, any sort of like um, food that really gives you a hard time at all. You know, like if there's anything that you know, you're going to be shooting X or Y today on set and you're like, this is going to be tricky. And maybe it, it's not the food itself, but maybe it's like, you know, the elements that go into the food, if it's glassware or whatnot, you know, is there something that you're, you know, you kind of got to play the Rocky theme song and psych yourself up for, you know, um, a challenge. Well, yeah, but, there's, a, there's a bunch of them actually, aren't there? I mean, yeah. chocolate, chocolates, as you know, are, <laughs> are a big challenge. Tell me, come on. I want to commiserate with someone who knows this <laughs> stuff. Then you recently did a shoot with these, you know, really cool, like the splatter um, bonbons and whatnot, um, yeah. the truffles and stuff. Well, I mean, the big thing is, you know, there's going to be a lot of retouching, no matter yeah. how careful you are. And, and you, <laughs> yeah. uh, it typically, be, I let the stylist deal with the, getting them in shape yeah, uh, and making them nice. And actually those chocolates you're talking about weren't as bad as uh, pure chocolate because they were sort of messy and had things splattered on them and so yeah. forth. Um, it was actually, they were slightly easier in some respects because a certain amount of messiness was built into it. Yeah. As they were course. beautiful, by the way. I mean, I, I was looking at them just yesterday and I was like, oh man, did you get them straight from the factory or did yeah. they have? To, yeah. So they were like as pristine as they could be too, probably. Even yeah. They, still, that's not perfect, but. Yeah. No, they actually picked uh, a ton of them out and we got them right away. So, yeah. so it was pretty good. Uh, but it, yeah, they required some work. Those ones were actually very hardy. It was fairly cold in the studio. So. That's good too. And they had a high, fairly high melting tolerance. Oh, uh, convenient. <laughs> in that case, the way they were produced, yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, obviously glassware is always an issue. We uh, uh, were just shooting something where everything had to be blacked out because you have the, how he's find glassware dead on, mm -hmm. um, you know, with something light in it. And suddenly you're picking up everything in the studio. And yes. You're picking up the surface and uh well so do you have tips for how to avoid that like you're saying black everything out do you build around the, sort of the subject that you're shooting yeah i mean if depending on what the angle you're using and what you have to do either typically we do a uh, uh an all white front with uh mm -hmm. v flats and paper and then cut out a hole for the camera that sort of thing yeah, yeah. Uh, or the reverse for black i use sometimes i use black velvet have big sheets of black velvet and hang them yeah. across the front and likewise cut out the camera and uh, you still know you'll, there'll be some retouching in the end but, yeah, it, but will, it's easier. it will minimize the um oh, I was just going to say there was something in this uh, uh the last shoot I did before what we shut down they, they were in glasses mm -hmm. and we couldn't figure out one stripe we were getting no matter I'm so glad it's not did. just me oh no <laughs> we were like I had my and every we're trying to figure out blocking different things yeah so finally it was my digi digitech who figured out it was one of the struts the ceiling's very high in the studio yeah just one of the beams metal beams in that studio was <laughs> catching it no kidding and, of course um it, there was no way to kind of block it out without completely changing the lighting which i think is what we had to do in the end yeah, no kidding. So we could put a card up there to block that out. So yeah, no, those obviously glassware is always a problem. I was going to ask because like when you look up how to deal with that online, the, the biggest tip is always the um, polarizing filter. And I like, yes. yeah, 
yeah. I, pol I polarize the, uh, I have sheets of polarizing material. Oh, okay. Uh, that I'll put a lot of times for the overhead light. I'll use a, a, a beauty dish. Yeah. Uh, with a grid and it's got polarizing material on it. So mm. you can rotate that grid. Yeah. And reduce the glare. And then I have a polarizing filter for the camera so that you can cross polarize. Okay. It reduces a lot of glare out of there. Or I'll use that light to light a label. Yeah. Uh, but you're able to turn the light source and cross polarize it and reduce even more glare. Yeah. So it's not necessarily as simple as putting on a single polarizing filter on your camera and being like, it's going to work. Well, it, it, I mean, it helps. Or, yeah. It helps. And uh, with glassware, I'd always have one on, frankly. And sometimes yeah. you want more, though. A lot of times it's like, you polarize it, you lose that beautiful stripe that you have in there and you want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Well, so um, we talked a little bit about how you've been doing photography your whole adult life, but did you, did you study photography in school or how did you initially get acquainted with the camera? I just, you know, my, my younger brother actually got a camera mm -hmm. for his birthday and he was a uh, He's a scientist actually now, and, but he, like many things, he, he picked it up, he learned all about it, he put it, built a dark room, developed, you know, learned okay. how to do everything, yeah. and then lost interest in it completely. <laughs> uh, so I thought, what the hell, this camera's laying around, and I picked it up, and I think really the first time I developed film and then made a print, and yeah. saw the magic of a print coming up. Oh my God, yeah, uh, in the dark room. I, yeah, I was sort of hooked <laughs> for life, so. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is, I, I kind of miss that. I, I, I was a horrible photographer in high school and college because I just didn't understand it as a medium. Like I wanted to be a painter or an illustrator or something, but I loved the dark room. Like I loved, you know, going to the enlarger, you know, I think I got it right, going to the pans and just like watching it start to emerge from the paper. It's, it's yeah. fascinating it, it, to see that. It's a thing of beauty for sure. Yeah, the smell and everything. It's, it's such a tactile thing. What are you doing these days, I guess, during the pandemic to kind of keep yourself focused or, you know, are you experimenting with stuff or trying things or what, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> um, well, of course, I, I'm fairly busy, to be honest. I'm mm -hmm. shooting some stock photography yeah. every day. I should say every day, but in trying to shoot some stock, doing a little bit of testing. I have a few projects in mind. I've also spent a chunk of time talking with my agents and uh, yeah, you know, plans on what's going on, uh, what to do. There's, there's a lot I should be doing that I'm not doing. I should probably be working more on promotion. Uh, yeah, but how? Like, how does that even function right now? I mean, that's, that's the big question. Well, to get even, like, you had that spectacular mailer. I mean, that was yeah, a, thanks. fantastic. They're all sitting in a box right now. <laughs> well, but, but at least to work towards producing something new like that, or, I mean, there's yeah. things that I should be doing that I, I, I'm not getting around to doing. It's, yeah. it's pretty easy to get lazy. Well, to be fair, though, it's hard to know what to put in that mailer at this point. What's funny, it's like the, the most recent one I did was like garden party for spring. <laughs> like everyone get together. <laughs> You know, it's like next year. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but and it's funny. I was, you know, I did this um, teaching gig at the Click Away conference, and I was thinking, okay, right when I get back, the mailers will be waiting for me. I'm gonna like address everything, send it out, and it was like within that week, the envelopes had arrived by the end of the week. But it was like, uh oh, everybody's working from home, <laughs> so I can't send these out. And then it's just been this like ever-changing you know scenery of like i don't know what's happening at the end of this week let alone next week so it's like i love yeah. i love seeing them it's cool to see your work in print but <sighs> the moment i wouldn't even know what to put together for the next one you know like maybe maybe some sort of pandemic themed mailer would be funny Playful? i don't know i don't, I don't know. know i don't either. know what i i, I... <laughs> I really don't know. I think it's, I don't think people are going to want to see pandemic. Yeah, you're probably right. I yeah. think they're, they're sort of inundated with it. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I was, it was interesting because I was watching a webinar last week uh, with Workbook and just kind of curious to see what they said because they, they brought together a bunch of um, art directors and 
you know, just producers and such together to talk about, you know, what, what does the landscape look like? And they seem to feel like a lot of the, the brands and, and big corporations were um, cognizant of what the new working situation is probably going to be. And they were talking about like insurance on set or waivers and stuff as well. Yeah. Like, cause how do you make sure that if somebody comes on set and they get sick, that they don't hold the studio or the agency responsible. And it's like, Oh my gosh, all these things to try to figure out. Well, we actually, we were just, we were talking about that as we were having new contracts drawn up with all those things. And yeah, as well, what happens if, um as if even let's say myself as a photographer mm -hmm. the day before a shoot i suddenly have a cough right yeah um <laughs> do you cancel the shoot you, you know, know the budgets and... the budgets are pretty big and there's a lot of people a lot of money involved yeah and yet i can't can i go i don't know i mean what's the what's the protocol and you have to have some kind of insurance for it and some kind of so i think costs are going to go yeah. up yeah, uh, costs will go up, and at the same time, it's going to be interesting because I think uh, because so many photographers haven't been working, there's going to be downward pressure on pricing. Yes, exactly. Upward pressure on costs. Yeah, and um, it, I I don't know I don't know what the tolerance will be with clients. Yeah, with yeah. that, uh, you know, we have right now we have pressure from clients to start working again. Yeah, that's scary. It's, I mean, like I'm eager to get started and do Me stuff, too. but I'm also like, Yee. <laughs> you know, if I'm, if I'm working from the home studio and I bring a stylist or something in, you know, then that's also risky. Or if we go to a studio, we have to assume that there's a certain level of cleanliness there, or, you know, it's going to be a challenge. 100%. It's a, it's a risk, and if you bring the more people you bring in, the the riskier it uh, becomes. And I think that's one thing that will change, and that might be for the better. Frankly, is yeah, a lot of agencies. Uh, I did. It was the most of one. I had one. It was I think they had twenty five people on set mm -hmm. between the ad agency and the food company. Yeah, it was a it's a big studio, and there's a big lounge upstairs and things, but. It was a nightmare. It was just it was just too crowded. It was crazy. So I think there'll be a new tendency then to have less people on set, mm -hmm. and only those people that need to be on set. It's also yeah. changed catering, by the way. We've oh, that's right. Yeah. We the the last thing we did actually we changed the catering because typically you'd have a buffet. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we would typically have like a buffet, small breakfast, and a bigger lunch. Yeah. And everything then was done as to individual orders boxed orders for yeah. everybody that was on set and everybody ate separately uh That's so and i think that'll world. continue yeah that'll continue for sure that it, everything will be segregated very much yeah definitely definitely um one thing i haven't touched on is sort of like um more towards like your working method but like if you had to um be on a desert island with one piece of equipment besides your camera which doesn't make sense. But like, uh, what's your favorite piece of equipment in the studio? Like, it's your workhorse that does all sorts of awesome things, and you can't, you wouldn't want to be in a studio without it. Forget the desert island, because you, you mean aside from a camera? Yes, correct. <laughs> Everything. I mean, I guess your light, the lights for certain. I mean, sure, yeah. A good lighting kit, yeah, uh, is essential. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, uh, there, there are some people who would like live and die by natural light. And I think for me personally, I, I would not want to rely on natural light ever. I, I never do. Yeah. 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 Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine trying to do a commercial shoot? I mean, maybe, uh, maybe it happens every now and then, but with natural light, I just think what a nightmare. It, it, well, it does happen. I, I know there are a few photographers around that strictly shoot natural light food. Really? And, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's beautiful light, but it's so variable in your timing. I mean, it's just so mm -hmm. the lack of control. I mean, you have to have a window that's in the right spot. I mean, there's so many different aspects yeah. to it that don't work for me. Weather. <laughs> Weather. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, if you're going to get a whole team together and you're like, we're shooting Thursday the 26th at, you know, such and such time. And then that day, a huge storm rolls in, you know, yeah. what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs>
Uh, okay, so we're getting close to the end. I've got like a 40 minute limit on this, but if you had any advice to give someone who's interested in getting into food photography, you know, what, what advice would you give them? To shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot <laughs> and keep shooting. I, I, really, I really believe it's a function of the more and more and more you do it, the more you learn, yeah. uh, the better you become. Yeah. And you just keep plugging away till you reach a certain point uh, where you have confidence in it that mm -hmm. uh, you feel like you can go and charge money for it. Yeah. 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 The more you do, the more you start to recognize how light does X or Y or what the camera is doing when you move these settings around or how you relate the position of your camera to the light. Like you start to get a feel for all of that. Like I know when I first started working with artificial light, even I was like, I had like three lights set up and all this nonsense going on. And it was like overcomplicated at first when you're just trying to figure out how to make a sandwich look nice or something, you know, Yeah, to keep it simple. Although, yeah. um, you know, I go, to, I have to say you go through phases and I used to use a lot of, I, I used to spend a lot of time trying to replicate natural light. Yeah. Uh, and that this is what light looks like at this time and so forth. And, you know, to replicate window light. And then I've evolved out of that, I think, quite a bit, mm. trying to do the exact opposite of that, Yeah, uh, which has probably become more popular uh, now as well. So I think another big aspect is to follow the trends in food photography. Yeah, absolutely. Which, which yeah, so changed. where do you find your inspiration for what you do? I think everywhere, magazines, uh, which are you know, less so mm -hmm. uh, than before, uh, online, just Instagram, you name it, the whole world in general, I think, cooking shows, yeah, TV. Yeah. Uh, if you look at what, what television commercials are doing. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah, typically that's what you'll see in still photography coming up in the next little while, mm -hmm. how they're doing those things. Yeah, yeah, that's good insight. Because the... the it's it's definitely true. I feel like a lot of the times what you see in the TV commercials are, are very sort of like um, just on the edge of what we're about to start sort of tumbling into as creators. And you see some really edgy, interesting stuff. And it's like, okay, well, how can we create that in a, you know, a still image and still get like that, that feeling that they're creating? Yeah. 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 Which is the other big thing, of course, combining the two. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole yeah. other subject. <laughs> for another day my friend another day yeah. <laughs> well this has been awesome i i really really appreciate you taking the time to sit down oh, my and pleasure. chat with me and um you know if we get a chance to do it again i'd love to have you back well do that was fun yeah all right well stay warm up there even though it looks like it's warm i know you <laughs> it's not that warm <laughs> oh i think i'll reach behind uh can't get behind the drape <laughs> no, too bad <laughs> thanks suzanne enjoy the rest of your day you too bye-bye Subscribe, like the video. I just want to make sure you guys don't miss out on any fabulous interviews.